Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Environmental Coffee House. Did you hear the bug pop? Did you hear him? He went pop right off where I filmed him on the, uh, the well, it's a bear that was a wood carver. Yeah, it was really cool. Well, good evening, everyone. I need to take a breath, all right, <sighs> along with you because... I was putting this together and then we get this storm warning and you know how I am about storm warnings. <laughs> so of course I had to run around outside and do things and uh, and then of course I get all ready and there's no storm warning. Yay! Maybe we'll get rain. I'm in here. <sighs> it's one of the things that is is happening here is that I've got this Okay, I'll show you. While you join, I'm going to show you this picture. This thing. This big-ass ladder. <laughs> right up in the front window. So if you get 40-mile-an-hour winds or, you know, something like that, this is what happens when you leave a ladder up, which is heavy. And I'm not taking it down. <laughs> so that, that actually is, uh, you know, you get a little... Um, nervous when the shit could hit the you know hit the proverbial fan so let me say hi hi Jean hello Dwayne hi Lindsay hi Lindsay uh Jean thank you yeah it's just filming I film everything I film everything hello Kate and hi Rich yeah you had a praying mantis that sat on the okay let me fix these things sat on the back of the house and you would pet him and he liked it that's very cool that's very cool i remember growing up praying mantises were it was illegal in new york state to i i think maybe it was all over the country to hurt them yeah mm -hmm. well all right i hope i have my camera uh good enough i've been farting around with that too today was one of those days i couldn't go out I mean, like, I didn't want to work outside. Everything was just, I'm just sore and tired, so I put together a show. And I will tell you, it's really interesting what I have for you. And uh, <clears throat> I hope you enjoy it. I put together an article. It's from 2011. And the dude's name is George Perkins Marsh. And he was a congressman back then. So we're going to do it a little differently we're gonna we're gonna read the story i'm gonna read the story but i also made a little film to go with the story so what's going to happen is this i'm going to play a film at the same time i'm going to turn off this music and we're going to watch this while i this okay so here we go with this and 
we're going to hear about, well, welcome to 1847. All right, guys? All right. And the reason why I got here was like usual in all of my travels on the internet. There was somebody that friended me on Facebook and uh, started me down a little history thing when I was playing around, and here we are. So this is Vermont, and this is where this dude was from, Vermont. So a near forgotten speech made by a U.S. congressman warned of global warming and the mismanagement of natural resources. That was George Perkins Marsh. When we think of the birth of the conversation, you know, the conservation movement in the 19th century, the names that usually spring to mind are the likes of John Muir and Henry David Thoreau, men who wrote about the need to protect wilderness areas in an age when the notion of mankind's manifest destiny was all the rage but a far less remembered American, a contemporary of Muir and Thoreau, can claim to be the person who first publicized the now largely unchallenged idea that humans can negatively influence the environment that supports them. George Perkins Marsh, and he's pretty uh, famous in Vermont. He had a varied career. Here's how Clark University in Massachusetts, which has named an institute in his memory, describes him throughout his 80 years. So he lived a long time for being, in, you know, in that time period. So he must have taken good care of himself. You know, grew their own food and <laughs> they didn't have any additives and bullshit in it like we do, right? He was... Uh, an indifferent practitioner. Um, he was an editor, a, she, a sheep farmer, a mill owner, a lecturer, a politician, and a diplomat. He also tried his hand at various businesses, uh, but he failed miserably in all of them. Marble quarrying, railroad investment, and woolen manufacturing. He studied linguistics. He knew 20 languages, he was known as the foremost Scandinavian scholar in North America. He invented tools and designed buildings, including the Washington Monument. I, like, okay, <laughs> who remembers this? Uh, as a congressman in Washington, well, if, maybe if you're in Vermont, right? Uh, 1843 to 49, Marsh helped to found and guide the Smithsonian Institute. He served as U.S. Minister to Turkey for five years, where he aided the revolutionary refugees and advocated for <clears throat> religious freedom. Uh, he spent 21 years of his life, the last 21 years, as a minister to the newly United Kingdom of Italy. Pretty cool, huh? Well, in other words, this dude kept himself busy. Uh, he, he, he would argue... The author would argue his defining moment came on the 30th of September, 1847, when, as a congressman in the Whig Party, which was the forerunner of the Republican Party, he gave a lecture to the Agricultural Society of Rutland County, Vermont. The speech was published a year later. It proved to be an intellectual spark that led him to go on and publish in 1864 his best known work, Men and Nature, Physical Geography as Modified by Human Action. More than 160 years on, it really does pay to reread his speech as it seems remarkably prescient today. It also shows that he was decades ahead of most other thinkers on the subject. After all, he delivered his lecture a decade or more before John Tyndall began to explore the thesis that slight changes in the atmosphere's composition could cause climactic variations. And it was a full half a century before Silvente Arrhenius proposed that carbon dioxide emitted by the enormous combustion of coal in our, in our industrial establishments, they might warm the world. Something he thought, something he thought would be beneficial. Well, you know, we really 
we we learned. But in his speech, he talks about civilized men and savages, and the language is turgid in places. But let's cut him a little slack because it was 1847, after all. So it's about halfway through he gets to the bit that matters most to us, you know, all of us, whatever you want to call us, label us today. Quote, man cannot at his pleasure command the rain. You know what? Do you want me to make this a little bit bigger? I'll make it a little bit bigger. I think I'll do that. Y'all saw the video already a hundred times. Okay. So man cannot um, at his pleasure command the rain and sunshine, the wind and frost and snow. Yet it is certain that climate itself has in many instances been gradually changed and ameliorated or deteriorated by human action. The draining of swamps, <laughs> the drain the swamp movement, and the clearing of forests perceptibly affect the evaporation from the earth and, of course, the mean quantity of moisture suspended in the air. So the same causes modify the electrical condition of the atmosphere. And the power of the surface to reflect, absorb, radiate the rays of the sun and consequently influence the distribution of light and heat, the force in, in the direction of the winds. Within narrow limits too, domestic fires and artificial structures create and diffuse increased warmth to an extent that may affect vegetation. The mean temperature of London is a degree or two higher than that of the surrounding countries. And Palas believed that the climate of even so thinly a peopled country as Russia was sensibly modified by similar causes. Some of the terminology he uses is clearly a little archaic, right, to our ears. But broadly speaking, his hunch has uh, subsequently proved to be correct. You can see him grappling with concepts that we now know as the urban heat island effect and the greenhouse effect. But in the speech, he also called for a more thoughtful approach to consuming natural resources, despite the apparent near limitless abundance on, you know, uh, uh, an offer across the vast expanses of North America. As the Clark University biography notes, he was not an environmental sentimentalist. Rather, he believed that all consumption must be reasoned and considered with the impact on future generations always kept in mind, like the, like the Native Americans, the indigenous, the seventh generation. He was making the case for what we now call sustainable development. In particular, he argued that his audience should reevaluate the worth of trees. And this is something I give a lot of thought to, trees. Really do. The increase... <laughs> falling on my house but the increasing value of timber and fuel outright to teach us that trees are no longer what they were in our father's time now remember this is 1847 guys um, an encumbrance we have undoubtedly already a larger proportion of cleared land in vermont than would be required with proper culture for the support of a much greater population than we now possess. And every additional acre both lessens our means for thorough husbandry by disproportionately extending its area. And it deprives succeeding generations of what, though comparatively worthless to us, would be of great value to them. The function of the forest, besides supplying timber and fuel, are very various. The conducting powers of trees render them highly useful in restoring the disturbed equilibrium of the electric fluid. They are of great value in sheltering and protecting more tender vegetables against the destructive effects of bleak or parching winds and the annual deposit of the foliage of deciduous trees and the decomposition of their decaying trunks form an accumulation of veg vegetable mold, which gives the greatest fertility to the often originally barren souls on which they grew and enriches lower grounds by the wash from rains and melting snows. I love this shit. The inconveniences resulting from a want of foresight 
uh, in the economy of the forest are already severely felt in many parts of New England and even in some of the older towns in Vermont. Steep hillsides and rocky ledges are well suited uh, to the permanent growth of wood. But when in the rage for improvement, they are improvidently stripped of this protection. The action of some and wind and rain soon deprives them of their thinner coating of vegetative mold. And this, when exhausted, cannot be restored by ordinary husbandry. They remain therefore barren and unsightly blots, producing neither grain nor grass and yielding no crop but a harvest of noxious weeds to infest with their scattered seeds the richer arable grounds below. But this is by no means the only evil resulting from the inju injudicious destruction of the woods. Forests serve as reservoirs and equalizers of humidity. In wet seasons, the decayed leaves and spongy soil of woodlands retain a large proportion of falling rains and give back the moisture in time of drought by evaporation or th uh, through the medium of springs. <coughs> Hang on. Okay, they thus both check the sudden flow of water from the surface into the streams and the, um, the low grounds and prevent the droughts of summer from parching our pastures and drying up rivulets which water them. Now, oh my God, this was 1847. Just imagine what has happened since then. And I think it is raining outside. Oh my gosh, yes, it's pouring. We are getting the, the rainstorm. Let me look. I don't see any way. I mean, we need the water. I'm not going to bitch, but it is, it is pouring, but I don't see any wind. I, I heard it, though. Okay, <clears throat> let's keep going, which I think is just amazing. So on the other hand, where too large a proportion of the surface is bared of wood, the action of the summer sun and wind scorches the hills, which are no longer shaded or sheltered by trees. The springs and rivulets that form their supply in the uh, uh, bibulous, that's a new one for me, bibulous soil, bibulous, repeat after me, uh, of the forest disappear, and the farmer is obliged to surrender his meadows to his cattle, which can no longer find food in his pastures and sometimes even drive them miles for water. Again, the vernal and um, aut autumnal rains and the melting snows of winter no longer intercepted and absorbed by the leaves or the open soil of the woods, but falling everywhere upon a comparatively hard and even surface flow swiftly over the ground, washing away the vegetative mold as they seek their natural outlets. They fill every ravine with a torrent and convert every river into an ocean. The suddenness and violence of our freshets increases in proportion as the soil is cleared. Bridges are washed away, meadows swept of their crops and fences and covered with barren sand or themselves abraded by the fury of the current. And there is reason to fear that the valleys of many of our streams will soon be converted from smiling meadows into broad wastes of shingle and gravel and pebbles, deserts in the summer and seas in autumn and spring. The changes which these causes have wrought in the physical geography of Vermont within a single generation, go Bernie, uh, and they are too striking to have escaped the attention of any observing person. And every middle-aged man who revisits his birthplace after a few years of absence looks upon another landscape than that which formed the theater of his youthful toils and pleasures. The signs of artificial improvement are mingled with the tokens of improvement waste and the bald and barren hills, the dry beds of the smaller streams, the ravines furrowed by, out by the torrents of spring and the dis diminished thread of 
uh, interval that skirts the widened channel of the rivers seem sad substitutes for the pleasant groves and brooks and broad meadows of his ancient paternal domain before the car this was. If the present value of timber and land will not justify the artificial replanting of grounds injudiciously cleared, at least nature ought to be allowed to reclothe them with a spontaneous growth of wood, and in our future husbandry, a more careful selection should be made of the land for permanent improvement. It has long been a practice in many parts of Europe, as well in our older settlements, to cut the forest reserved for timber and fuel at stated intervals. It is quite time that this practice should be introduced among us. <sighs> but they're not, are they? After the first felling of the original forest, it is indeed a long time before its place is uh, supplied, because the roots of old and full-grown trees seldom throw up shoots. But when the second growth is once established, it may be cut with great advantage at periods of about 25 years, years and yields a material in every respect but size, far superior to the wood of the primitive tree. In many European countries, the economy of the forest is regulated by law, but here meaning Vermont, United States of America, I pledge the allegiance. In many European countries, the economy is regulated by law, but here where de public opinion, he wrote, public opinion, now the internet, you know, determines or rather in practice constitutes law. We can only appeal to an enlightened self-interest to introduce the reforms, check abuses, and preserve us from an increase of the evils I have mentioned. That was good shit back then. Of course, I don't agree with some of his uh, writing because um, of, I think he was of the time and of the religious persuasion where everything was for the human being. Everything was for humans, right? So <clears throat> it is 150 years ago this, mar this year. Now, this was 2011 this was written. And... Uh, <clears throat> he was personally appointed by Ab Abraham Lincoln to be the United States' first ambassador to Italy. Just three years later, Lincoln approved the legislation which would lead to the creation of Yosemite in California. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hang on. I'm not going to cough in your ears. So um, Yosemite was made, and then the act uh, as a precedent across the world for federal and state governments to purchase or secure wilderness areas so they could be protected in perpetuity from development or exploitations. And that didn't happen because it's drill, 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 baby, drill, drill. Um, it's speculation, of course, but I've always wondered, this author, if he ever, you know, discussed it with Lincoln, these manner you know, these, these conservation matters in person or in correspondence. Perhaps there's a keen historian that knows the answer. And I did not follow up. I, I didn't follow up, but I liked it. I thought it was definitely a Sunday afternoon. I think, guys. Did you like it? Let me see what, what you're up to in the chat. Um, well, I did. And... Uh, I have another little thing. Um, hi, Kim. I have another little thing, but I I guess I, I just want to look out the window and see. Oh, yeah, it's still pouring, but this is great. It's filling up my water thing, and it's giving me a respite from having to get out there and hand water because I still have not fixed my irrigation, the drip, and I decided maybe I would not. Well, thank you, Jean. I'm into trees. And in fact, yesterday, my friends came over and uh, they bought, listen here, 135 acres of beautiful land. And it's all, um, a ba uh, it, nothing's going to be built around it because it's federal and state land where they bought. But what it was, 
and he got a great deal. It was logging land. And so there it, it has been thinned out. And he said a lot of it's newer growth, but newer in the last maybe 20 years, 10 years. But he's got gold. See, I think land is gold and uh, he's got it and they're going to build a cabin. And she's like my really good friend forever. <clears throat> and we, we went out and we went over to talk to uh, my Amish neighbor who may build the cabin depending on how big it is. And they use wood. And let me tell you, I've seen the wood over there and it's New Hampshire wood. Some gets trucked in. It gets trucked in from all over. And wood is when is it going to end? So like my friend's property is newer trees and uh, he's not going to do any kind of logging because they have to grow back. It's not empty. It's wooded. But what he did get with this was a staging area where they staged all the lumber and the logs. And it's a steep steepish driveway but they staged that so now he's got a natural place to build up the hill so I can't wait to go over and see them you know see their place it really sounds great and they were here yesterday it was just really nice to have human beings come over especially human beings I've known since I was uh, myself pretty young yep yeah it was awesome so that's my story about trees and of course I'm concerned, and I don't have the pictures up of my disease trees and uh, uh, the split one that's in the front. Uh, my neighbors came over, and we looked at it and maybe decided just try to go one more year without taking it down and hoping that it doesn't fall, you know? Yeah, so what's going on with you guys? I don't know. What else did I put up? Do I have any more funny pictures? Oh, yeah. Okay, so when I was looking through this... We'll go just really quickly on this one. I <clears throat> noticed that every, it doesn't matter. Like in the beginning, there's always a million articles now on climate change and everything going on around it. And I clipped that little picture because it's just what happens, you know, it, it is. Um, all right. Jean has a question. Let's, let's answer this. And if we have to look up the answer, we will. Is the UV rays affecting the trees or the heat? You know, and okay, in my estimation, it is more the bugs. In my case, I think it is the maybe the uh, the weather that the weather patterns changing. But what I found, Gene, are larvae from not indigenous bugs and they are killing the trees the beetle the bark beetle and they are disgusting so i would say that's the first thing that i think is going on here and the second thing we've had a drought uh last year it was too much water um you know trees in new york state in different areas are being affected but of course i'm not a tree specialist but i do ask the questions and study enough and i definitely think i would say it was the in, it, the pests first that were brought in you know in in di from different places because well if you look at those shipping boats that come into the new york harbor let's say and they bring in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shipping containers from other countries. They can't possibly catch everything. And these bugs just, you know, they hitch a ride. The Japanese beetle. Yeah, there you go, Chris. <clears throat> yep. Yep. So they, yeah, they hitch a ride on those, those things. So I see, um, Michael. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Depletion from souffle. Yeah. The stuff we put up there. Yes, absolutely. Sulfuric acid, soot and massive wildfires. Yes. The trees are changing. The times they are a changing. Don't forget it because they are. All right. I have a little other one I want to play and it's just a, it's a two minute intermission and I'll stand up and it's not going to be a super long show. I don't have another article, but um, I'm going to play this because I always like this one. So we went from, we're going from 1847 and we're going to one of my favorite clips. Here we go.
I had written an article on the greenhouse effect. It was a year-end article. They wanted me to pick out the most important scientific event of 1988. But I thought that the most interesting scientific event of 1988 was the way everyone started speaking about the greenhouse effect because there was a hot summer and a drought when I had been talking about the greenhouse effect for 20 years at least. Uh, and there were other people who talked about it before I did. I mean, I didn't invent it. So I explained what was no. meant by the and greenhouse effect. we just heard effect. about one. And I also explained that not only were we constantly pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere because we're burning fossil fuels, coal and oil and gas, so that the content of the atmosphere, as far as carbon dioxide is concerned, has been going up steadily, not very rapidly, ever since 1900. And it's continuing to do so. The amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now is 50% higher than it was in 1900. It's still, it's still only a little over 300, 0.035%. It's enough to trap the infrared waves that Earth reflects into space and to raise the temperature of the Earth slightly. The temperature will keep on going up. And not only are we piling in more and more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but we are chopping down the forests of the Earth at a great rate. And Bingo. the forests themselves are the most efficient consumers of carbon dioxide that there are on Earth. And if we replace them with desert, which is most likely, it won't absorb the carbon dioxide at all. So that, in a sense, we are contributing to the greenhouse effect in two ways. By, by pushing the output of carbon dioxide and inhibiting the input, so to speak. You can go through the entire list of dangers that face humanity. And the very point of the whole thing is that they face humanity and not any one section of it. And in order to solve these problems, in order to make sure not just that our progeny will be prosperous, but that our progeny will live to go to the solution of these problems, we cannot expect that this will be done by individual nations. The only way is by a human solution, a totally human solution, an international solution, a cooperative solution. It is important that the world get together and be sufficiently a unit to face the problems which attack us as a unit. The problems with the ocean, with the atmosphere, with the soil, with the population, with pollution, with anything you want to aim. Do not distinguish among us. How then can we distinguish among ourselves? There must be some way of getting together and of deciding not that the United States will tell Brazil what to do, not what Brazil will tell the United States what to do, but what the people of the earth will tell themselves they must do. We have no difficulty applying this principle to the United States itself. We don't say that New York hasn't got the right to tell California what to do, that California hasn't got the right to tell Florida what to do, when it comes to international trade, when it comes to any facet of national life that rises above the parochial needs of cities and states, the federal government tells all the states what to do, and the federal government can do it because it consists of representatives from all the states. Well, what we need is some sort of federal world government and the only problem is how we manage to do that. A federal world government. Now, let me tell you, first off, every 
body that hears that, if any of them hear it, would say, it's the Great Reset. Of course, I don't know if Isaac Asimov uh, knew who Carl Schwab was. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, the, the thinking... And there's another thing I had been going to into, and I, I did not have the expertise to do a show on on what it was, but they were talking about world government and um, and but not you know certainly not in I mean what they what I was listening to was not about this this way this guy Klaus Schwab that's his name and the, in that way but that the the problems are never going to be solved because people can't get together. You know, we're still a warring uh, world. So it's not going to happen like that. And Isaac Asimov wasn't seeing a great reset. Isaac Asimov wasn't seeing the evil empires take over. Isaac Asimov was talking from the heart. You know, it's one of my favorite clips. That's all. So um, anyway... Melanie, the only way we will ever be able to make a better place is to change the whole economic and legislative system. Yep, we are all connected internationally, intersectionality and more. Yes, we are. Well, I have to look for something that's not positive. I don't know if I found a flush of the day yet. Is Earl here with us? Hmm. Let me think about this. Is there a flush of the day? I don't know. I don't even have anything pulled up from Twitter to flush down. <laughs> All right. I'll tell you what. I'm going to flush down what actually happened. And what happened to us should have been flushed down a long time ago which is greed and hubris, like I put in the beginning. Okay, Earl, will that make you happy? There we go, Earl. Greed and hubris, human greed and hubris, right down the toilet. Yep. Well, so what did we learn today, class? What did we learn today? We learned that some guy in 1847 was talking about all of this. Um, <laughs> was was talking about all of this stuff. And uh, maybe he had different ideas because, like I said, the religious um, viewpoint, and still is for many different sects, is that the earth is here for us. It's our bounty to take, and we're going to take it. And we have been taking it. So there you go. All right, let's look at you guys. <clears throat> I don't really have a lot more that I wanted to go into other than having conversation with you. And, uh, you know, we made the flush. And so I'm happy, and so is Earl, as long as Earl is happy. <laughs> Hi, human, and uh, I'll say hello. Hi, T-Bone and Foggy and Patty P. Hi, Lisa. Um, it's really great to see all of you. Really, it is. I don't think I have any. Oh, here's one more thing. This is completely off the topic. Wait, let's see. What was that? Oh, no, it isn't, actually. Just another picture. It, 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 this was another thing that was on. Uh, people were sharing it around this week. And this is the furnaces, the science, 1912, the furnaces of the world, coal consumption uh, affecting climate. The furnaces of the world are now burning about, what, two gazillion, trillion, a million tons of coal a year. <laughs> Might as well have been. When this is burned, uniting with oxygen, it does add about, what, seven billion tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere yearly this tends to make the air a more effective blanket for the earth and to raise its temperature the effect may be considerable in a few centuries and here we are there we are now that one should get a little triangle and now we have our magical thinking because it's all the 
going to be okay. There's a techno fix right down the road, guys. Yeah, the techno fix down the road from me is a farm that is now a solar farm. That's the techno fix near me. All right, so where are we? Does anyone have a question? Not that I can answer it. Philosopher Dale Jameson has a fabulous book documenting the history of climate science, uh, Reason in a Dark Time. Awesome. I have to read Carolyn Baker's new book first. She's probably not happy. <laughs> and um, we were supposed to have that done. I haven't been able to do anything because I'm so outside all the time. Um, do I have any other pictures? I don't think I had any. No, death. I just showed you. Yep, that's about it. I did not, except for this one, that ladder, which I obviously guess it didn't fall down because the, <laughs> the rain has stopped. So I didn't get blown away. I did not get blown away. Do, 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 do. Okay, let's pick some music for the, for the question and answer period. <laughs> What are you guys in the mood for? Come on, guys. I have all kinds of stuff. How about some, you want some techno stuff? You want to go techno? All right, let's go techno. Here we go. All right. Yeah. Since we started with, what, 1847? Let's end with techno. Techno. Come on. Question and answer period. Uh-huh, here we go. Very few talk about sulfuric acid that is produced by burning fossil fuels. One uh, day gas furnace used uh, five gallons of water of condensate. Not to mention the water issues going on. Like, you know, everybody talks about all these different techno fixes and, and nuclear energy, which somebody around here that I'm trying to get, I want to have interview who is pro-nuclear energy. Um, you know, this is what I think of. I think of, you know, yeah, here we go. Here we go. The techno fixes. When am I supposed to stop? <laughs> stop it, Sandy. All right. Anyway. Okay, here's a good one. I see Michelle. Lemon juice is really good at disposing of unwanted bugs. Just saying, it may help. Whatever you're talking about out there, that sounds like it makes sense to me. Lemon juice is acidic <laughs> by the way i made pickles yes last night i made a shit boatload of pesto and i froze it and i froze a bunch of it yep 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 mm -hmm. so that's what's going on all right i've been hot long okay 42 minutes i was going to keep it to 45 so here we go that's pretty cool all right guys come on what's going on oh uh, connor uh, anyone who thinks a U.S. constitutional convention wouldn't be hijacked by right-wing capitalist billionaires is deluding themselves. I agree with you. It would, of course, it would be. We don't want a constitutional convention. All right, Gene, Sandy, something personal. How did you get so good at making artistic and well put together videos? Practice. <laughs> I don't know. I just like doing it. <laughs> It's, they're easy. For me, it's really pretty, it's pretty um, simple. I haven't even graduated to Vegematics channel and, uh, and um, T-Bone's uh, le level of expertise. I'm still a baby because I didn't get the computer yet because I don't have the time to hook the new one up. And then I'm going to, you know, you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to learn more. I really want T-Bone to give me some pointers and vegematic vegematics channel chris he's a great videographer holy shit i mean he's not a videographer he's an artist he's wonderful okay how do we take the occasional deluge and get it underground to recharge the aquifers Ooh, how do we take the occasional deluge and get it underground so instead of runoff you mean to have more uh I would say what more holes in the ground, more um, uh, sewers that that then flow the water down. That's deep. That's drilling deep there. I don't know. Of course, I'm not an engineer. My I, and when you ask that question, how do we get? 
it makes me think, how do you? Well, you know, if they can frack the shit out of the ground and go that far down, why can't we go down the same, you know, clean and just sink the water down there? I don't know. Hmm. Hmm. That was a good question. You got my mind started thinking. Michelle said caverns. How do we get them in caverns? Okay. Oh, okay. Where's the pewter? I didn't order it yet. If I get it, it's going to sit here and I'm not going to have time to put it together. So I'm going to get it when all oh, the season is over. If I, I mean, I know what I want. I picked everything out. It's just, that's another box sitting here and making me feel guilty when I have to finish one thing at a time. I have a whole winter ahead of me to sit in the house and do all of this learning and creative stuff with the, and I, I pretty much decided on the, the, the Mac, the, um, but the, um, not the mini, cause I don't want to have to fuck around with all these different screens and stuff. The iMac. I think that'll work. So yes, guys, it's coming. And then I think we'll do even better stuff. Well, I know I will because of you. Thank you very much. All of you. All right. Let's see. Uh, one thing I found out for sure that people that are controlling the world are known are are neither Democrats or Republicans, um, or oh I see yeah. The world are no longer. Let me get this again. Or Democrats are right or left. They they look at politics as a joke. You're talking about the billionaires. You're talking about the moneyed people. They look at it as a joke because they look at us with disdain. Unfortunately, the, the, those on the right I love to elect millionaires, and those on the left are just too, like, like stupid, sometimes St. Bernard's that run over and they don't care. It doesn't matter if Nancy Pelosi's got $100 million. <laughs> oh, no. It does to me, and it does to us. I would love to see money out of politics. I absolutely would. T-bone, T-bone, T-bone. You have to put it together. Damn, Sandy, how cheap is that computer? It's not. It's a good one. That's why I waited. I saved up everything so I could get everything. So this is like the last computer. Well, I already have the last vehicle <laughs> kind of thing. All right. More questions. Um, pesto. mm 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 mm, -mm. Oh, and I got this kick-ass vegetable pasta, uh, pasta. It's just peas, and I like it. But, of course, how long am I going to be able to get that? Yep. All right. Melanie. Yes, it is now unsafe to drink rainwater around the globe because of the growing presence of forever chemicals, suggests in the study published August 2nd in the peer-reviewed journal Environmental Science and Technology. Oh, that was a big discussion because I just put my uh, rainwater barrel in. <laughs> conveniently when everything is fucked but uh, you know you you work around it when you're learning the things that I'm trying to do you know and hi foggy you repair your topsoil to get the water rain to soak in mulching composting and no-till farming can be required see and these are all the good ideas for the things that we're all trying to do those of us that are trying to homestead and uh, you know hey feel good feel good Let's see. Hi, climate, astrologer, climate witness. Um, all right. So, yeah, they have to try to keep us hating each other so we don't turn on them. And that's a whole other thing. Does, is, does the kind of activism today that's happening work? Because it doesn't. And I had wanted to make one comment earlier. I forgot all about it. When Isaac Asimov was talking about you know, doing all this, getting together and all. And then I thought, okay, we did with the IPCC. And where did it go? <laughs> oh, okay, T-Bone. He ordered a web camera and a mic. Sandy, get that damn computer. All right, I'll order it. But are you going to come over? Are you going to come up from Florida and help me clean out this uh, mess of a studio room? <laughs> okay. Awesome, Sandy. I had water barrels in San Antonio and need to set them up again here in Missouri. Yeah. See, we're doing this all together, and that's why I love this channel. I love all of you because you're wonderful, and you help me out. 
you help a girl out who really got down on her luck from having a stupid I could say what I could say about my ex who still has an I'm still not legally <laughs> divorced because he's a dummy <laughs> and he doesn't ever get in touch with his lawyer because he thinks he's gonna have to pay him more money <laughs> all right TMI TMI uh-oh uh-oh that would get us sad music we don't want that do we want sad music no fuck that I'm not sad okay wait should I find some more yeah okay we'll end up we'll, we're gonna end up with this stuff yeah 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 all right we're all gonna do the rain barrel thing together yeehaw just check your local because you know if you have your little fascist uh town board that doesn't want you to do that forget it oh i love having all your comments up here i have a whirlpool no filter change whole house filtration system it was 455 years ago just got a zero above sink one to get more stuff out but the whirlpool gets chlorine and a lot oh hmm. i have reverse osmosis for my uh, house well it's pretty good it's pretty good yes she's right frack your ex sandy that narcissist will get him to sign the fucking papers already oh my god i shouldn't be doing this okay here we go anybody want to buy a used dam on the colorado river oh okay wait a minute if i wasn't playing music let's get an applause on that one yay who wants to buy a used dam on the colorado river <laughs> i love you guys okay question when can you do super chats never i'm not monetizing i'm not monetizing doom I don't want to do that. I, I've told everybody. I love you all. We have the, the little buy me a coffee. Wait, I'll put the stupid thing up here. Here we go. <gasps> buy me a coffee. Like and subscribe. It's cute. You make up your own mind. It's not an impulsive thing. I don't like the psychology of the heavy marketing on the um, channels the way, you know, and I know you guys are great and I've given super chats. I've told you a million times. I'm not going to monetize, so... Buy us a coffee, that's that's the way. Or PayPal. And then you think about it. And then what what you do and what you donate gives so much more meaning. Okay? Alright. That's good. Well thank you everyone. Oh no, you're a doll. You're a doll. I know. And I explain it and I love you for it. I just don't want to do that. And I don't want the I guess I don't want to get too big that I can't handle it because I can't even handle the I have the uh, Facebook and I can't handle it all. <laughs> Hell, I can't even handle all this house. <laughs> hey, this is good. Is anyone interested in going in on property and communal living with non-humans as equals? I love it. And I told you that. But it wouldn't, it, it's, it's not, we were looking at properties here. It's a pretty cool place here. You know what? He's a. I think this is a good thing. I would love to bring people together. And actually, so does uh, Sam, Collapse Chronicles, likes to bring people together. All right, guys. I'm going to change to the good old, good old, everybody knows this one. All right. Thank you. I love you guys. Thank you. I like Sundays when I can do it. And Jennifer and I will be on Tuesday night. Hi, Steve and Steve Angelico. Hello. And I, I, I love you, Rich. Who loves you, Rich? I'm gonna. All right. Maybe I'll sit here and just order it tonight. Just do it. I have the special computer account. And then I'll take pictures of it. All right. Good night, everybody. I hope you learned something. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Ed. Be kind, everybody. You're all beautiful. <laughs>